Good afternoon. Welcome to the joint meeting for the Rules and Open Government Committee, Committee for the Whole, for Wednesday, October 28th. Uh, we'll begin with a roll. Tony? Arenas, she's absent. She emailed me. Um, Davis? Camus? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. You have a quorum. Okay. We have a small uh small but mighty group here okay we'll start then with the uh review of the final agenda for november 3rd um let's look for any changes you'd like to make starting on pages five and six and lee i assume there will be a 3.1 report on this one right there is not a 3.1 report for oh. COVID, no. Okay. Does that come in the following week? It's coming November 17th, actually. We're trying to include a lot of the uh, rebalancing and the strategy there. So we would like an additional week to compile all that information. Okay. Uh, this may actually be a meeting we get out on an ordinary hour then. Uh, pages seven and eight. Pages nine and 10, any changes? Pages 11 and 12 and page 13, any changes? Okay, let's go to the public. Uh, David Winley. Shut the fuck up, nigger. Here, fuck. All right, we're going to do our best to prevent any more of those folks from jumping on. Um, we've seen quite a bit more of that in the last couple of days, so my apologies to everyone who's listening. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Hi, thank you. Uh, we're all trying to figure out how to work together. Uh, I hope they people who do that, they want to contribute something to this process um, to be helpful. Uh, yeah, those words don't really do anything to help anything. So good luck in how to better help instead of their current process. Um, I'm interested in the housing issues that will be on. And actually, I'm interested in the overall, uh, you know, how you'll be, you'll be talking about housing issues in the next few weeks. And these are issues that do exactly that. They invite the whole community to ask ourselves, you know, what are we going to be doing with ourselves in the next year about housing and affordable housing? And, um, you know, it's a difficult time and it's going to be a difficult election process and how we all need to, you know, work safely through this next stage of COVID we're going to go through together. So um, good luck in these housing issues, uh, affordable housing issues that, you, that you're having on the agendas in the next few weeks and uh, how we can um, work together to, to consider new ways of affordable housing um, and how affordable housing can be, a, you know, learn to be a part of, you know, regular housing plans and structures and, uh, and, and all the interesting new ideas that can happen within affordable housing that, that we can talk about uh, important work at this time and, and thank you for it and, and good luck to, to yourselves and to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, on the November 3rd agenda, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Right. We have to be on our game. We're the only ones here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Women usually know what's going on. We have to actually pay attention now. Okay. I'm here. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right. Welcome. All right. Uh, let's vote. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. We're on to Tuesday, November 10th. Uh, we'll review the agenda for any changes beginning on pages five and six. Pages uh, seven 
and H pages nine and 10. Just heavily housing focused um, and page 11. Expect there will be lots of housing discussion. Okay, um, we'll go now to the public. Mr. Beekman. Hi, I read that you're going to have a, an item about uh, body camera footage uh, in extraordinary situations. You're going to be trying to be releasing. Um, you know that. Thank you. That's a part of you know what what we're learning to do. Uh, it's important, um, but what about body camera footage for day-to-day -day issues of, you know, pe person's court trials and and things like that? You had a public hearing in, in early January that, you know, a person really decently asked he needed uh, body cam information for his appeal process, and you have a system developed where he could not get that information that was just simple information for a court appeal process. And that's, you know, simple legal stuff that, that should be by the book really easy to figure out and, and work towards. Uh, this extraordinary, you know, stuff is, is one thing, but you got to do the day-to-day -day stuff too about how the public can, can be allowed information more and how it can be more accessible. And, um, you know, that's, that's, I, I wish you luck in those, those efforts. It was very nice of you as a city to have that. You had a, a open public hearing about it in rules and open government in January 22nd of this year, I think it was. And, um, you know, that, that's an important component to the body camera question and, you know, to the overall question of will we be having body cameras in the, in, in the future? And for that question, you know, that we're, we're, we're starting to ask ourselves in the meantime, how do we ask ourselves what can be, you know, accessibility for the public for just court trial process? You can't even do that for the public at this point, and you need to work on it. We're all trying to. Good luck in how we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Back to the committee. I should just note on Mr. Beekman's point. Um, that um, prosecutors are required under federal and state law, typically under the Brady decision to turn over any exculpatory video and any video that relates to an arrest. So that's not a um, that's not something within the purview of the city. We're just dealing with issues where we are not dealing with criminal litigants, but uh, the courts regulate all that issue. Okay, uh, on this November 10th agenda. Motion to approve. Okay. All right, any discussion? Let's vote. Amos? Aye. Amos? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. We're under the public record, item E. I didn't see anything on the public record, Mayor. Neither. Maybe I'm mistaken. Okay. All right, we'll move on then. Um, Item uh, G, the uh, consent calendar. Motion to, to approve. Second. Let's vote on that item. Do we have any uh, members of the public? No. No? Okay. Davis? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Davis? Aye. Hammes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're on item two, which is the medical marijuana business tax exemption. Uh, Council members Camus and Foley have proposed this. Uh, would either of you like to speak before we go to the public? I, uh, I'm happy to take the lead unless you want to, Councilman Camus. The, you're the lead on this memo. Go ahead. You took uh, yeah, but you took the time, so go ahead. <laughs> you <laughs> took the time to be here. I don't want to have it wasted. So uh, you have the item before you, which is to direct staff to explore, analyze, and report back to city council on taxation of medical marijuana. And I'd just like to give a little background on 
why we feel that that is important. Medicine should not be taxed at 35%. To many folks, cannabis is a vital medicine that helps people get through the day. They use it for joint pain, for back pain, for all kinds of traumas. These prescriptions are written by doctors and therefore should be considered a prescription. The Sunfair tax system is hitting seniors the hardest and driving folks back to the illegal underground market because they've been taxed out of the ability to buy their own medicine. The underground market is helped by all sorts of demographics and we have to reduce their ability to conduct business. And this is one way that we can do that by removing the unfair tax burden on those who hold medical marijuana cards. The problem is that products in the black market are untested, they're unsafe, putting our seniors in sick, vulnerable populations at risk, and it's becoming a health issue. We should be advocating that there be differences in the cannabis industry. There should be those that use cannabis for recreational purposes and those that use cannabis for medicinal purposes. Unfortunately, at the peak of shelter in place, it was incredibly hard to identify those who use the marijuana business who, who um, were uh, recipients of the medical marijuana card. The marijuana business tax should be waived for medical patients with an ID card. That would bring our taxes to a more reasonable level for these patients, although it may have a financial impact with the city. I'm concerned that this might get yellow lighted and pushed to priority setting, set, setting session. We already have an item, item moving through priority setting that has to do with cannabis land use and cannabis equity program. And perhaps it's, uh, this can be added to that and brought back with the work plan when that comes to CED in a couple of months. I request that you add this to the agenda and that we consider it uh, in the next agenda. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Kims? Yes, uh, and, and I don't know if there's anybody from the public, but uh, just to break it down, there's uh, nine and a quarter percent local taxes in San Jose. Then we have our 10% marijuana business tax from Measure U, and that's the San Jose tax. So San Jose uh, is responsible for 19 and a quarter percent of that tax. And then a 15% excise tax from the state of California. So that's where we get the, the 35, close to 35% taxes on, on uh, cannabis. And, you know, it, it, and, and I don't think that this is ex, ex, would cause undue hardship because there's, there's not a whole lot of people that have these medical, medical cards. And so I think, um, uh, you know, I, anyway, I, I just would, uh, it, it's a more fair way of doing things We'd, uh, for the city of San Jose. And uh, I will make a motion to approve this memo. I, I will um, second it for the purposes of discussion, but obviously we need to hear from staff because this item was yellow lit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lee, would you, would you wanna offer your perspective? Yes, absolutely, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the administration does recommend a yellow light um, for this work item, meaning that it would go to priority setting. Julia Cooper and uh, Rick Bruno from Finance are here to answer any additional questions on that. I would just say that even of the existing council policy priorities, as we've told the rules committee before, since um, COVID-19 and the shelter in place, uh, very little work um, has taken place on those council policy priorities, given the focus um, of the EOC and the roadmap. So our ability to add this into existing priority uh, would be minimal because uh, that work is not moving forward right now as those people working on that have been activated in the EOC. Okay. Let's, um, thank you, Lee. Let's go to the public now. Uh, Crystal? Hi, my name is Crystal Campisi. I'm an activist for medical cannabis. I'd like to make a couple of points. I would really not like this to be lumped in with land use. This is not a land use cannabis issue. This is a tax issue. The other thing is that we need this more than ever during COVID. There's a Careers Act and a MORE Act in Congress, and when one of those two acts pass, we will have an additional 5% federal tax 
placed on cannabis, which will raise our tax to 40%. We can't wait two more months. We don't want this in with land use. We don't want to hear back from staff in two months. We need this now. I have to go. I went to buy one item yesterday for $40. And when I left that dispensary, my bill was $58 for one $40 item. And I'd like to read to you from the public safety report that came back from public health uh, concerning, this is a report that public health did for the county because they're looking at the, the card. Uh, let me read this to you. Taxes on marijuana. Non-medical recreational marijuana is subject to an excise tax, cultivation tax, and sales tax. Effective January 1st, 2018, at the time of sale, purchasers of marijuana or marijuana products sold in California must pay an excise tax of 15% of the gross receipts in any licensed business. State and local governments may also impose additional sales and use tax on non-medical recreational marijuana, but not medical marijuana. At this time, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara has not yet considered or approved legislation to impose any additional sales and use taxes. This clearly states that San Jose cannot impose taxes on medical marijuana. It's in Prop 64. So how are we even getting away with charging this? Should not be charged, it should be waived for card holders and it needs to be done now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Uh, the person ending in 5140, we're not able to hear you yet. So, hello, hello, can you hear me? I've been having a hard time getting through today. According to Scott Hughes at Pam Foley's office, you guys didn't see my hand raised. I somehow find that really hard to believe. But I do believe that considering I'm probably the most unpopular person on the city council, and, uh, you know, uh, or, I, I'm sure the city council is not crazy about me, nor, nor are you, Sam. But when it comes to the pot tax, potheads need to know that there's tax on beer, wine, liquor, cigarettes, cigars, pipe tobacco, and it's taxed all the way through with excise and the whole, the whole nine yards, federal taxes on down. So they're going to have to learn for years and years. They said, hey, man, we want pot legalized. And it'll be just like alcohol. It'll just be just like cigarettes. Well, there it is, people. There's the tax that you thought that you were going to somehow magically get away with. Now, I do believe that all taxes – on beer, wine, liquor, cigarettes, pipe tobacco, and marijuana should be taxed at a normal rate. But as usual, the state of California, the county of Santa Clara, the city of San Jose wants to just give it more tax. And guess what? You guys aren't getting the revenues that you should because everyone's going back to Joe the pot man. Okay? So, I mean, I don't even smoke pot. I hate potheads. Marijuana is for losers. But you know what? Tax it at a normal rate. And don't get too greedy with it. You know, Pothead Perales, he likes to rub his hands together when he wants to talk about what revenue he thinks he's going to get from the pot tax. And the city accountant no, told him that there's not the, the money isn't there because it, nobody understands that on top of that, these dispensaries are skimming the cash. I mean, if I owned a dispensary, you guys would get next to nothing. And I told you, Sam Licardo, if you want to get the revenue straight, keep the tax normal. All right, thank you. All right, returning to council. Uh, on, on, the, um, on the process issue, uh, I'm concerned about moving forward. Uh, I think staff has clearly said, first, the land use issue has not had significant work done on it. Um, as I think Crystal Campisi, who spoke a few minutes ago, said, this is not a land use issue, so they're not related, other than the fact that they involve the same kind of business. Would involve uh, finance and probably legal and a lot of other folks, not the land use folks. So that's a whole another different work stream. Uh, so I, I'm concerned about uh, an end around around our process. Um, and look, there's a lot of things we urgently need to do in this pandemic. I'm not certain that reducing the amount of uh, our budget is should be at the top of the list, given the fact that we're going to need to do everything we can to keep the wheels on. Um, we're facing a, a very, very serious fiscal situation in the year ahead. So I, I would support this going to the 
uh, prioritization process to allow the council to, to consider this uh, along with all of our other priorities. Other comments? I'm sorry, forgive me, I just missed the hands. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I agree with you as well. The staff was very clear on uh, the um, inability to move a lot of these initiatives forward uh, just because of their constraints dealing with the COVID crisis. Uh, as much as I'd like to see some relief for um, um, cardholders, uh, we just have to deal with the reality that we just don't have the resources there to work on it. So I'd like to ask uh, Council Member Camus to modify his motion to direct it to priority setting. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know what your thoughts are, Pam, but um, I, my, my, my concern is this, I, I, and Ms. Campisi is correct. This is, this is a different staff level. It's a finance staff level, and I know that finance is busy as well, so I understand. Um, so, so I understand this issue, but I mean, we've been talking about this issue for quite some time. And, you know, I, I, my concern is that it is kind of an unfair tax because this is a, a medicine itself. Okay. Mayor, may I? Yeah, sorry about that. My dog's at the door. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate that this isn't a land use issue, uh, and I want to address that one in, first. That was actually supposed to come back to council last year, uh, and it wasn't. For some reason, it was delayed, and now it's got stuck in COVID. And I certainly understand the delays of COVID, but the delays didn't start at COVID. The delays resulted, uh, I'm not really sure why, it was one of the top items that received votes in priority setting last year and uh, was stalled until uh, myself and a couple of others started pushing for it to move forward. You're absolutely right. The medical marijuana, um, medical, mar yeah, medical marijuana is not a land use issue. But since the land use issue isn't moved forward, the reason I suggested it be added together is that they all all be combined. I certainly understand, but uh, uh, to Crystal's point, she wants a quick answer, and I understand she she's not aware that this thing takes time anyway because you would have to investigate the financial ramifications of reducing the tax, but. These folks who use marijuana for uh, medicinal purposes, and that does not just mean um, ingesting, that also means uh, CBD cream and other sources that are used for pain relief, and that's mostly our senior citizens. It becomes very expensive, and they get taxed at a higher uh, a rate that they shouldn't if this was a prescription and going into a a pharmacy and getting a drug. So I appreciate where you're coming from. I certainly understand you're you're the body who makes this decision, but I just had to make one more plea and uh, encourage you to consider putting it forward. Thank you. Thank you, council member. All right, any other thoughts? Okay, so um, I didn't get a sense that there was a modification in the motion. No. Um, so, we could vote on the motion or we could hear a substitute motion, whichever the, the committee prefers. I'll, I'll make a substitute motion to refer this to priority setting. Okay. I'll second that. I, you know, I agree that we have uh, many other items on our plate right now. And, and I am sensitive to the fact that this is uh, medical use. And, and I do want to see this situation rectified. I just, I know how, um, how many things we do, we do have on our plate. And I would even, I would, I would agree with the, the public commenter that, that this should probably be prioritized over the land use item um, related to, to uh, marijuana businesses. But we we make those decisions together at, when we're when we're looking at what what did and did not get done for uh, in, in staff's work plan and I know that we're going to have some very detailed discussions when when we do start with priority setting and we'll know a lot more about what staff capacity is going to be at that time. 
Yeah, if I could offer a um, bit of an olive branch to Ms. Campisi, who raised the issue about Prop 64. Perhaps, Nora, if, if there's, um, if you could make some inquiry on your team about any concerns about the legality of the Measure U tax in light of Prop 64. I believe we passed Measure U after Prop 64, so I assume um, it is proper and legal because I think Prop 64 only bans sales tax, but I could be wrong. Um, so if we could just check just to make sure it's actually legal, obviously if it's not, then that would be something we want to bring forward sooner. Sure, we'll definitely go back and and uh, look at that question. Okay, thank you, Norm. All right, then on, on the motion, let's vote. Davis? Aye. Camus? Nay. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item three is authorizing membership in the California Community Housing Agency, uh, Cal CHA, to prevent displacement, increase housing affordability. That's coming to us from Councilmember Camus. And yep, would either of you like to chime in? Yes, Mayor. Sorry, um, I actually also have some folks in the audience that ha that I'll be asking questions to, and I'm hoping that they can work with Tony to to put up a slide or two. Um, you know, uh, and thank you for allowing this. After a brief introduction, I, I you know, I, I could tell you that on Monday I chaired the Economic uh, Development Committee for the City of San Jose, and housing was a big topic. Uh, we. It was cl incredibly clear we're, we're falling extremely short in producing workforce housing. The city's busy building extremely low, very low, and low income housing. The developers are building market rate housing, and, and no one is effectively addressing the housing that is at 80 to 120% of the medium income, which we commonly refer to as, as workforce housing. In recent weeks, uh, we also it <clears throat> extend, uh, extend talked extensively about how to preserve affordable housing and options of workforce and avoiding displacement. And we took an all, uh, all you know, all of the above approach. We passed 10 different uh, ideas. And I'm, I'm bringing forward this idea because I've been talking about buying and not building but to help solve the, the problem uh, quickly. And it solves a lot of different challenges and we can use the marketplace to do so. So I raised this issue, I took this issue to, the, uh, to Ahmad Thomas, the new CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and he brought to me this great opportunity for us to join the California Community Housing Agency to preserve and develop workforce housing here in San Jose. The agency leverages private um, investments in tax-free bonds to purchase um, or develop workforce housing for the missing middle. Uh, the, uh, it's being used in several cities and other jurisdictions, including Hayward and Livermore, whose staff reports and uh, are included um, with this agenda item. So we've 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 already included what what they've done, and like with the like with the Pace program uh, of putting solar on your home, the city council will have uh, an amiss, an a mysterious role. Uh, in approving this program. There's no resources to the city for this program that will be expended. Uh, I think that this could be a win, win, win for everybody. Our workers will win because affordable housing will be either established or purchased and they'll get to stay in San Jose. Our taxpayers will win because they're, uh, these projects are funded by private investors, not another tax or, or fee hike. The city wins because in the it eventually gets the properties after the bonds are paid off. They don't even have to manage the project at all. There's, so there's no staff needed. And also there, um, there's no risk to them. These bonds are, if, if they go bankrupt, that the, the, the investors are on the hook and not taxpayers. Uh, so we'll all win and this could happen quickly as, um, as, as you know, it, it has in other jurisdictions. I do want to put up a slide just to show what we saw um, at, the, at the CED committee. And if I could figure out how to use my share screen, uh, there. Uh, you could see that <clears throat> we're falling really far behind in the production 
and the goals that that um, that we that we set out for ourselves to create 25,000 affordable housing units. Uh, anyway, uh, I, so I, um, you know, I have uh, with me today to make to make a presentation about the Cal CHA, the Joint Powers Authority. Um, I'm joined by the founder of um, Catalyst Housing, Jordan Moss, and I don't know if um, uh, if, if we can allow. Uh, hey, Jordan's Mr. actually in the room. Oh, is he? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, allow him to do a presentation? Uh, sure, Jordan. Sure. Uh, how long is your presentation, sir? You know, I was actually just going to speak for a few minutes, if that's okay. I felt yeah, in the interest sure. of time, maybe we'd avoid. Yeah, the keep it, thank you. Keep it pretty high level. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, thank you, council member, for the introduction. I think you did a great job uh, hitting on all the, the sort of important parts of, uh, of our program. You know, the backstory here is that we've spent 20 years in the multifamily space. When I started Catalyst at the beginning of 2015, we were focused on more traditional affordable housing using tax credits and traditional private activity bonds to develop ground up affordable assets. And we pretty quickly realized, you know, A, we didn't think that was a scalable solution to California's housing crisis, given the scale of the crisis here and B, um, as the council member was just touching on, there's a reason that we have terms like the missing middle in the first place. There are no subsidies or motivations of any kind today to produce housing for nurses, teachers, first responders, all of these essential workers who earn in excess of traditional affordable housing requirements, but not enough to live directly within their communities. And I think if you look at, if you back up and look at the, the state of California, the three largest super commuting regions um, in the country are all here between Stockton, Modesto, the Inland Empire. It's very clear what's happening. People just drive and drive and drive until they can find affordable housing. So we spent a couple of years, we put a working group together, really trying to find a more scalable programmatic capital structure that also allowed us to address the missing middle. The culmination of those efforts was the launching of a new state agency, Cal CHA, the California Community Housing Agency. It's a joint powers authority. It's a political subdivision of the state. And its sole reason for existence is all about the furtherance of middle income housing across the state of California. Uh, our company Catalyst is now partnering with Cal CHA. We have a lot of meetings like this with various jurisdictions across the state. There's currently 17 members of Cal CHA, cities, counties, housing authorities. We've been unanimously approved in every jurisdiction to date, which we're excited to report, not one dissenting vote. Um, and that's really the first step to us being able to do what we do. Other than joining the JPA, uh, there's no cost, there's no liability to doing so, and authorizing Cal CHA to issue bonds locally, uh, which also creates no liability and that the city is not the issuer, the city is not credit enhancing or backstopping these bonds in any way, they're backed solely by the project revenues. Um, you know, the only other piece is the city accepting the surplus economics, as the council member mentioned. So not only do we immediately create a desperately needed band of middle income housing, but on a long-term basis, as these bonds are paid off, all of the embedded equity, the control of the asset, the control of the affordability, everything is granted to the underlying jurisdiction through an option. It's just an option. It's not an obligation to take title. The city would retain the right to assign its option to someone else to ask Cal CHA to sell the asset. But the, you know, the, the, the product of this is desperately needed middle income housing units across the state. We will have soon close on our fifth uh, transaction with Cal CHA, all of which are in Northern California in aggregate. That's about 1,500 units that we have acquired over the past year and a half. Um, in total, that's about $800 million of total transaction volume. Uh, so I'll pause there. I know I, I threw a lot at you, but happy to answer any additional questions that anybody has. Okay, why don't we go to the public uh, and then we'll come back for community discussion. Um, Mr. Beekman. Hi, starting off with Blair Beekman. Thank you. Um, I'm getting my clock cleaned on this one. Uh, you know, I've been talking recently about the importance of extremely low and very low and perhaps uh, most importantly, mixed income ideas, housing ideas at this time. And it's just slowly seeping through my pea brain that, uh, you know, you have been working on extremely low and very low income ideas in some way. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, it's been, that's been the work that's been going on for the past couple years that, you know, that CASA 
you know, has, has been really important about. It's had an important part in that process. And I, I suppose what uh, Councilperson Camus was saying earlier was that that, that work is, is coming to fru fruition at this time. And, you know, I'm, I'm just really interested what will be our next steps at this time. I think the CED meeting on Monday was really interesting in what's possible, uh, what you can be working on towards the future with these issues. And I've, I've expressed my, my feeling that, you know, mixed income, you know, how to bring people from the 80,000, 90,000 and 70,000, how do we bring them? Is it possible to consider living in the same place with 30, 40 and $50,000 income people? I mean, no, those are the kind of uh, new ideas that I'm, I'm thinking about. And overall, just, you know, what, what is the language we could share that, that is just a bit more open? How, how can we open ourselves and be a bit more creative in our thinking? And what, what can we allow of ourselves that I know we think about and want to think about? And uh, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's my job and that's my role is to just ask those questions and what can be those next steps. And uh, so thanks for, for this item and good luck with your work. Thanks. Thank you. Vince Rocha. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So uh, as was stated earlier, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group does support uh, the City of San Jose joining the California Community Housing Agency. This is really important to encourage uh, preservation, prevent displacement, and uh, production of missing middle housing, also known as workforce housing in some contexts. And I think what is critically important here is to understand that um, city dollars are being used effectively for uh, VLI, ELI, uh, low-income housing programs, um, but this program is scalable for the middle income. And we want to ensure that if the city joins, uh, it'll allow us to have multiple tools uh, at the city's disposal. We've seen San Jose be a leader in affordable housing, but to continue being a leader, we need to have more tools because we've seen that despite all of our efforts, it's not been enough. Um, and so this is the time to make sure the city really is utilizing every key uh, uh, tool at its disposal uh, for affordable housing to make sure residents can stay in San Jose, uh, work in San Jose, um, and, and continue to raise their families in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Reagan, welcome Matt. Mayor Licardo, council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Matt Regan. I'm Senior Vice President of Policy at the Bay Area Council, and I manage our housing portfolio. I also have the good fortune slash misfortune of uh, sitting on AVAG's Regional Planning Committee for most of the last 10 years. And um, as Mr. Moss pointed out in his presentation, um, we are home to some of the uh, longest commutes in the United States of America. Um, we have 200,000 people, these are pre-COVID numbers obviously, but 200,000 people a day commute into the Bay Area from their, jaw, uh, their homes rather outside our region. Um, we are creating uh, excess amounts of greenhouse gases um, uh, uh, from those super commuters. And Mayor, as you know, we are grappling with how to reduce those greenhouse gases in our uh, regional plans currently and how to do that without destroying our economy. This idea, this plan, this proposal, this GMA, um, is the secret sauce uh, for missile, missing middle housing. We can't subsidize our way to missing middle. The market can't build for missing middle. Uh, we need innovative financing solutions, innovative ideas uh, that leverage public financing uh, in a way that uh, doesn't put the public on the hook. Uh, it's the private investors really that are taking all the risk and the public's accruing all the benefits. So we would urge you for multiple reasons um, to approve uh, joining the JPA and moving forward with the motion today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ben Metcalf. Good afternoon, I'm Mayor Licardo, a Rules Committee members. This is Ben Metcalf. I'm a principal of Stronger Foundations, managing director at the UC Berkeley Turner Center and formerly head of the state's Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, the story of the last couple of decades has been one of increasing tightening in the rental market for families between 60 and 120 percent of area median income. Here in Santa Clara County, almost three quarters of households are burdened below uh, 80 percent of median income and almost half of families in the moderate income space are rent burdened as well. Um, that, that number is gonna get worse as we come out of the COVID crisis. 
um, and our uh, status for renters and our property owners' uh, conditions deteriorate even fur further. In that same moment, we see um, state and federal funds for low-income housing flatlining. Uh, the same pot of fund is getting uh, fought over by an ever greater share of worthwhile projects. The elegance of the Cal CHA model, of course, is that it takes an innovative approach in leveraging revenues generated from the sale of Cal CHA issued revenue bonds to finance the acquisition of these properties and to lock in affordability, critically needed affordability for the long term without further draining um, local county or state state funds. Uh, for those essential workers like nurses, teachers, first responders, librarians, this is what they need to stay and be successful and part of the solution for making San Jose's economy vibrant on the go forward basis. Particularly at a moment when uh, no subsidy is being asked, uh, no, no significant staff time is called for from the city's housing department. This is a no brainer. It's a win, 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 a no regrets move. And I encourage the rules committee to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. How much public housing do the taxpayers have to build before the city just runs out of money and the county and the state and whatever you get from the federal government, which won't be a lot since Sam hates Trump, but that's another story. Um, why is a taxpayer on the hook when people can't pay their employees enough to, to be able to own, own a home here? Uh, I, you know, People who are doctors, lawyers, and engineers are struggling with being able to buy a three-bedroom, two-bath track home from the 1950s. Uh, people in Sunnyvale are selling houses for millions and millions of dollars to people who work at Google, and they're able to afford it, but they don't have much left over after the fact. So I, I, you're, you're talking about a massive, massive regulation of everything if you want it to work, and it won't. But if you, if you think you can keep building coffin condos and these, these, these temporary housing, it's just going to – it's going to – it's going to be uh, high-tech favelas. Just, I told you guys, why don't you start building favelas in the hillside? You know, uh, it'll look like Brazil someday if you guys keep up what you're doing with with low-income housing. I, I I just don't see uh, the end to it unless Silicon Valley decides to move uh, their their offices to other places like Indiana and o Ohio and uh, Arizona, New Mexico, all these other places. They're taking in Silicon Valley firms, Texas, of course. So you guys are you guys are in a in a losing situation if you're going to think you're going to keep building more and more low income housing. It doesn't work. And and what happens to the low income housing? All of a sudden the price goes up. All of a sudden doubles in price for some mysterious reason. It happened just a few months ago in this town. And uh, I mean, what do you expect? Thank you, uh, Tim Bovian. Good afternoon, Honorable Vice Mayor, Mayor and Council Members, Tim Bobian representing the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors and our 6,000 plus members. SCORE supports the memorandum authored by Council Member Camus and Dieppe for the City of San Jose to join Cal CHA. This innovative new strategy is a perfect tool to continue to work to solve the region's housing crisis. Becoming a member of Cal CHA will allow San Jose to quickly create much needed housing for our, missile, our missing middle population, such as nurses, teachers, and other public servants without enduring any displacement. It also will create a pathway for the city of San Jose to acquire long-term affordable housing assets. Uh, because of these reasons, strong, SCORE strongly urges the city of San Jose to join Cal CHA, and thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, returning to uh, the committee. Um, Obviously, a uh, key focus here is on the uh, response from staff. Uh, I know housing and finance staff are implicated, it appears. Uh, and I, I've read the, uh, the page two of the council uh, early consideration response form. So Jackie or, or Julia or Lee, do you want to weigh in about staff's position? Yeah, I'll uh, ask Jackie to jump in. She's been much closer to this uh, than I have. 
Sure. So um, we have had a chance actually to meet several times with Jordan and Catalyst to better understand the model. And we have had, frankly, large staff meetings that include staff from housing, finance, and the city attorney's office to start looking in depth at this structure. And the challenge is uh, we have identified uh, numerous issues that we would need to resolve. Um, and they are not simple issues. And we have very limited staff. And given where our resources are now invested in our COVID-19 response, we can't begin to address some of the issues. Um, and we frankly went back to Jordan and said, can you solve them all? And it's a go. And, and there were certainly limitations on what he was willing uh, to address when the city first brought our concerns to him. Um, and in the meantime, another entity has uh, come up that can actually provide the same exact service that Catalyst is offering us. And so we feel like we need to look at the other entity, which is CSCDA, which is also now offering bonds that can, uh, a program that can do this exact same thing that Catalyst can. And so I think we need to see which which of these two entities would best meet the needs of the city of San Jose? If you look to see who's become members of Catalyst, it's much smaller cities uh, that don't have the level of experience uh, in terms of bonds and finance that the city of San Jose has and that have looked at this model very carefully. So, you know, ultimately we think the model is a very good idea. We think there's a way to work with it. We just don't have capacity to do the level of work that's needed to actually get this over the goal line. Okay, Jackie, thank you. Um, let's put aside, let's assume we're in a world of unlimited uh, bandwidth and all the, all the housing department, finance department employees in the world. Um, why wouldn't this be an and rather than an or? I mean, I understand CSCDA may be promising, but CAPS is also promising, why wouldn't we want to do both? Well, again, we're still not convinced that the catalyst model or structure is actually still the best one for the city of San Jose uh, in terms of its, um, the, the people who run the current JPA have no experience in housing bonds at all. They are far from the city of San Jose. Um, and so the level of transparency regarding this institution is something that we've expressed a concern about and the level of experience, not of Catalyst and their team, but of the actual entity that is providing oversight and is actually issuing the bonds uh, does not have the level of experience um, that one would expect for, for doing these kinds of transactions. Certainly the team is excellent, but the underlying institution that we're gonna to have to rely on uh, to provide oversight of Catalyst is not one that has the level of experience uh, that one would expect. Can you help me understand just the downside risk? I understand that there may be problems with the inexperience of this team or with other uh, businesses that maybe other groups that are trying to do this, um, but we're not on the hook, are we? Well, some of the things that, so some of the concerns that we had was that we were concerned about the level of the fees, the transaction costs were very high and much higher than the transaction costs that we see for affordable housing bond transactions. Uh, we have little or no control over the property and certainly we have seen in bond only transactions very recently, um, the challenges when the city has no rights um, and uh, if a property does fall in disrepair, uh, as you have seen in recent transactions in the low income housing program, um, there's a challenge for us if, if we can't, uh, if we have no oversight over the property because we're not issuing the bonds. Uh, there's potential residential displacement in the years 15 and 30 if we don't use our option to purchase the property. Uh, we don't know if all of Catalyst's uh, requirements will align with city priorities in terms of policy priorities. Um, 
in terms of transparency with the TEFRA hearings, um, the increases in rents, the reporting requirements, uh, income requirements and income standards. And then lastly, we were concerned about what happens with the revenues um, at the time they sell. So there, you know, there's two pages worth of issues that we would need to work out with Catalyst. And again, we still have to have a comfort level that the underlying JPA is one that the city should risk its reputation in joining when again, the entity doesn't have any experience in housing bonds. And then what happens if Catalyst moves on, if they get out of this business? Okay, I guess, Jackie, we're, I'm, I'm just struggling with this. We have lots of affordable housing builders that we'd love to have more in our city. And we don't have controls over their boards. Uh, we don't have, we may or may not have city money in the project, right? Which may or may not enable us to have any regulatory authority through funding, but we still have code enforcement. We still have, you know, renter protections and other, there's still ways for us to regulate. I'm just trying to understand why we're concerned about this lack of control if, let's face it, the overwhelming majority of our housing stock is built by people and entities we have no control over. Yeah, but you're not adding your name as the city of San Jose as a partner to the creation of this housing. When you join the JPA, you are saying the city of San Jose is behind this and supports this. And so it is a risk without us being very familiar with the entity or the JPA um, that has been created. And again, we, you know, even if you look at their website, um, they lack the information that a standard bond issuer of these types of transactions would be posting. I, I don't know if Julia wants to jump in yeah. regarding yeah. The, the risk yeah. that she that feels yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the risk better. It's yeah, I mean, as to Jackie's point, you join the JPA, so you're a member of that JPA. When you go to the website, you know, when you get a staff report, when you're approving a bond issue, you get a staff report. We just don't put in front of you the resolution and say, read the resolution and determine how this project's going to work. The, I couldn't find any staff reports on for these transactions presented to the, to the Cal CHA board when they're approving the transactions. So how does a member of the public or anybody who wants to really understand what's happening know how the transaction is coming together? So... Right. So, you know, that, that's an area that's very different from when, when we think about interacting with you as an elected body. You know, and then to Jackie's point, you know, we are a member of the JPA. The project is here. There are very slim margins here. And, you know, this is a new type of financing that hasn't been tested with respect to how it qualifies for tax exemption. And I think the city really wants to understand how that works. Because if at some point, if the IRS were to come in and do an audit, they could declare the bonds taxable, right? And while the, yes, there is a tax opinion from a well-renowned law firm in this space, I still think it's the city's responsibility if they're gonna participate to make sure that we have a comfort level with respect to how that analysis was done. So, and are we, we are-, are we liable financially somehow? No, no <laughs> we're not. At, at the end of the day, the investors would be responsible but at the end of the day, we have a very, you know, we are the 10th largest city in the country, the third largest in the, in the state. And if you look and see the cities that are entering into these transactions, they're not our peer agencies, right? So we would like to have some conversations with our counterparts in San Francisco, LA, San Diego to figure out, to understand, have they looked at this product? What are their concerns to make sure that we're really doing a deep analysis and understanding you know, if there are risks. And we we feel when we, even though we're not the issuer of the bonds, when there's a product going out there that somehow has a tie back to us, that we really do care about our investors and want to make sure that they're getting a product that they don't end up with something in the future that has a, a risk for default, a risk of revenue, or a risk of being declared taxable. So those are a whole host of questions that we just think we need more time internally at the staff perspective to look at, to give you a comprehensive staff report that outlines what we view as the issues. And as Jackie mentioned, there is another JPA that's entering the realm and would want to, to look at those as comparisons. 
Yeah, and I would encourage that. I, I'm just trying to understand why. I mean, we know it's so brutally hard to get affordable housing built in this city. We don't have enough resources. And this is an approach that doesn't require us to. And, the, and these, pro these are all acquisition projects. These aren't construction projects. So it's taking an affordable project and converting it into this um, workforce housing. So it's no new units. You never get a new unit in the city out of these products. But we have incredible fights over rent control, which I know doesn't add anything to the housing stock, but mm -hmm. there's value because there's rent restrictions. Yes, and, I, and we would say that there would be some value to the rent restrictions, although clearly at this time, at the income level that we're looking at, you know, Class A has fallen to that income level right now. So it, you know, it, it could even be challenging, frankly, to, to implement this model um, where we're going to get much lower rents because the market on that top end has really dropped to what we would see in a product like this. Okay. Okay, other questions from the, the panel? Mayor? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing, oh, there we go. Um, so I see Councilmember Davis and I just heard Councilmember Camus. Uh, why don't we go first to Councilmember Davis and we'll come back to you. Thank you. Jackie, to your point, um, does that mean that the value of those apartments have, have come down and that this kind of financing might in fact be an opportunity to restrict those rents to that level before they go up again. I mean, we, there will be a, a recovery. One hopes it is swift, um, but this, may, this seems to me like maybe it's a good time for these kinds of purchases so that we can, we can lock in those, those rental rates for this middle income. And I don't, Honestly, I don't, I, this is the first time I've heard of Cal uh, CHA, so I don't have a, um, a particular, you know, affinity for them one way or the other, but, but if there are, I didn't even know this moderate income public bonds existed, and now you're saying that there are two, and we haven't taken advantage of either one. I mean, I, do we, is this, is this a case where we're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in a time when we could maybe take advantage of it at, at this time? Actually, we included a conversation about this model when we brought forward our moderate income housing strategy. And so it has been something, and actually we had agendized it last year right. as something that we wanted to explore. Um, but unfortunately, again, there were many issues that staff felt that we needed to work through with Catalyst before we should take it forward to council and then bam, COVID hit. So right. it's not like we had not been exploring this and that's why we have you know two pages worth of issues that we would want to negotiate with Catalyst before we bring it forward. And the second entity is is brand new. The the, the new the JPA. It, it's just, it's something within the last couple of months that I've heard that is actually uh, that's created the same product. So it wasn't available last year. So you know again, I it's not that we don't think this is a viable idea. The challenge is getting it to the the place where the staff feels comfortable recommending it um but you know given again the very high transaction costs um and the other the property risks the displacement risk um they're just some policy issues we would need to negotiate with the structure and again knowing that the entity is in kings county in some rural part of california where we would have very little co communication with the jpa um, and again, knowing our most recent example of having a bonds only affordable deal, which did go into total disrepair, which many council offices have this particular bond issuer in their council district, it's not like those other tools that we think we have can be effective. And, and everyone looks to us again, they're going to come back to the city to say, you know, why didn't you do this? So 
just given our past experience uh, with understanding that there's always risk when our name is attached to it. Yeah. So do I, I think the undertone there is, it sounds like you might want to structure something, Jackie, where we have some skin in the game in these, in these um, acquisitions so that they're not 100% bonds so that we do have some uh, level of, I, I don't want to say control, but oversight on those properties. Correct. And it's not that we don't, wouldn't, it would be more that there would, and, and I think Catalyst was going to be very open to providing some of the concessions that we had begun to talk to them about. It was really the potential to structure another JPA that they were not interested in. So we would have to go with um, the Kings County structure, which again, as Julia has mentioned, is, has not been very transparent, does not post the information that we typically would see for a large issuer. Yeah, and I, I understand the, the hesitation to join a joint powers authority. I, as you know, I'm this, the San Jose um, member of the JPA for Caltrain and there are, there are certainly complications with JPAs in general. So I understand that. Um, I'm just thinking about the pension obligation bond work that we're doing and we've acknowledged we're laying the groundwork for that to try to um, maybe not so much time the market but be ready when the market is is at a point where it will make sense for us and and I'm thinking about this in that same way which is why I'm hesitating to say let's wait for priority setting as opposed to it sounds like you're you're already doing the work, but what to what do we need to have a motion today for you to continue prioritizing that work? If I can jump in, I think you know we, as it says on the early consideration form, this was part of the housing department work plan um, in coordination with the attorney's office and finance department, and they were doing this work prior you know, prior to COVID-19. And obviously a lot of work in the organization as we've talked to you guys has stopped uh, during COVID-19. So I think, you know, we've kind of expressed some of the red flags that have come up thus far in the analysis yeah. prior to COVID-19, but that's not a conclusion. I, I think we're, we're, ca we're, we're characterizing those red flags as this is actually more complicated and it's not as easy as just joining just to simply clarify the workload. The, the workload is a lot, even if we don't have a lot of skin in the game, because yeah. something does need to be structured appropriately. With that said, I think if all things being equal, um, you know, and if, if, if there wasn't existing capacity uh, for housing to loop back on this in the near future, it would go to priority setting. Um, but, you know, as we right size the EOC and, and try and right size some of the staffing levels, if, if there were additional capacity in the near future, they could loop back around to this work. It doesn't have to just be in priority setting now, but given where we're at and the staffing levels and, and where we're at in the pandemic, that's what we're suggesting. But I don't want the, the committee to assume that you know, the red flags we're raising now to illustrate a point are foregone conclusions. That, that work is in progress or was in progress, I should say. Okay. That's helpful. Can I just jump in to follow up on that, Lee? I guess the question I have is, you know, I'm not expecting Julia and Jackie to say yes. Clearly, they have reasonable concerns and they have conditions that should be met. But clearly, we have at least two actors out there in the market. Why wouldn't this be green lighted just so that Jackie and Julia could go say, hey, here's our 20 conditions. If you want to partner with us, then it's got to be aligned with these conditions. So at least the entities have a clear sense of, okay, this is what I need to do. Either I'm going to jump through these hoops or I'm not. Um, and if they're not, then, you know, there's no more staff work to do, right? Uh, if they are, then one would assume our, many of our concerns would be addressed. I, I guess that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled that we're saying, I mean, you've already put an enormous amount of work in. This was already on your work plan. It feels as though we're saying, we're going to stop any communication when, you know, I think we could be 
you know, we, we're in the position of being able to say, look, these are our demands. You don't have to accept these. We've got other work to do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, and I do know that Jackie has has done that thus far with the first JPA, handed over a, a list of concerns. Um, and if, if it is simple as the JPA addressing every single one of those concerns, um, then I think we could reassess. But as my understanding and talking with Jackie that there was quite a bit of back and forth already and there could be additional back and forth to negotiate those points that would take additional time that I think that we have right now. Okay. But that said, I think we would, we would be happy to communicate out what we've communicated out thus far, which is here's the concerns we've come up with thus far and see if they can be addressed again. Yeah, I mean, it could even just be a public document. If any JPAs want to join us, here's where our conditions are. I, I'm, anyway, Councilmember Kimmis? Uh, Mayor, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Councilmember yeah. Davis. I just wanted to make sure my hand had gone down. Um, oh, I just want to give Jordan a, an opportunity to, to respond. I know Jackie had brought up quite a list of questions. I, I actually only got a few of them down. Um, can you can you respond to Jackie and Julia's concerns? I'm happy to, yeah. Um, I, thank you. I haven't, I don't have the two page list. I was trying to furiously take some notes here. So I'll do my best to, um, to respond. So, you know, first of all, from a transparency standpoint, um, you know, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's no transparency here. Cal CHA is a public entity. They abide by, you know, all of the rules and um, guidelines of any public entity. Their meetings are open to the public, to anybody who wants to attend. Um, you know, I don't know that, I, I think they, they post to their website what they're obligated to post to their website, but I'm not sure, um, you know, why that should necessarily be a sticking point. Um, from an experience standpoint, um, Cal CHA, like many JPAs, has staff. Um, their staff has been in the business of issuing bonds for housing, not only housing transactions, but for other asset ownership transactions for the past couple of decades. So, you know, I, I would definitely disagree with the sort of lack of experience. Um, the staff is actually based here in the Bay Area in Walnut Creek um, and has, you know, done tens of billions of dollars of this over the past couple of decades. Um, from a, there was a comment made about tax exemption on the bonds. Um, it's Oric is the law firm that has done all of the work on this. They were part of the working group that we put together a number of years ago before kicking off this work. And we, you know, very specifically chose not only the best law firm in the business, but the very best partners at that law firm, uh, Justin Cooper on the bond side, Rich Moore on the tax side, who specialize in exactly this. We obviously put a lot of weight in the tax opinions that they have issued around this structure and the tax exemption of the bonds, as do the bondholders. You know, we're selling these bonds to people like BlackRock, PIMCO, and Vesco. They don't take this lightly. Um, they, they have their own counsel that digs into, you know, uh, all of the tax opinions and comes to their own conclusions. Um, you know, there were some comments made about concessions that have been asked of Catalyst. Um, you know, a lot of these are not concessions for catalysts to make or not make. I mean, um, there, there, there's sort of a structure here back to the concept of, of tax counsel and bond counsel and what works and what doesn't work, um, as well as liability that's either created for the city or does not exist for the city. Um, so some of the things that have come up are not actually, you know, just sort of concessions for us to independently uh, abide by. And actually, some of them are things that are currently uh, protecting the city from any liability as to uh, opening the city up to liability. So, for example, the fact that every jurisdiction who joins Cal CHA joins as an additional member, as opposed to some founding member that's on the board, is exactly what separates each of those individual members from liability, from anything that the JPA does, or from anything that any of the other additional members of the JPA does. Um, there's been comments made about how this is new. Um, there's a reason this is new. We created this. This had never been done before. It took us many years to sort of get here, and we had to create a new entity in order to do this. So, you know, it's sort of impossible to, uh, I guess, provide, you know, a, a decade-long track record um, and to, at the same, you know, to, to sort of deflect the fact, you know, no one's hiding behind the fact that this is new. I mean, we, we're very proud of the fact that this is new, that we created a solution you know, some of our supporters earlier called in and referenced that never existed before to address the missing middle, which is desperately needed. Um, you know, the comments that have made, been made about CSCDA, 
um, they and others are now trying to catch up to what we have done here. We're very much aware of what they're trying to do. Um, I would definitely not, uh, there, there's, there's nothing about, I mean, there's no model there yet. They have not closed a transaction. I mean, I'm sure that others will be successful. We hope that others are successful because uh, first and foremost, you know, we are supportive of housing for all. And so we hope that others are able to adopt similar models and do this. Uh, but I think as the mayor said, you know, seems like an and as opposed to an or type of situation. Uh, there was a comment made about not having TEFRA hearings. There's no requirement for TEFRA hearings when you issue governmental revenue bonds. Those are specifically tied to private activity bonds and more traditional capital A affordable housing transactions. There were also some comments made about around fees. Um, once again, a private activity bond structure is very different than an asset ownership structure like this, a governmental revenue bond structure. Um, I'm not sure which component of the fees in these transactions that anyone has a problem with, but they're all very public. Um, they're all signed off on by not only Cal CHA and their board and their staff, uh, as well as um, the, our bankers and their staff, but ultimately the bondholders. Um, and it's all, it's all public. Um, it's all very clear. These are public bond offerings and anybody can go on Emma and pull down any of the offering documents and see exactly what the fee structures are. And if, if they were deemed to be egregious, once again, we would have a hard time attracting the institutional capital that acquires these bonds. Um, from a, there was a comment made about sort of reporting. Uh, we have, as the asset manager, Cal CHA's project administrator, there are ongoing reporting and accounting responsibilities quarterly, annually, not only to Cal CHA and to their staff and to their board, but we have ongoing continuing disclosure responsibilities to the bondholders. Once again, all of that is public. I think there were comments made about the incomes. There's a regulatory agreement in place that once again is public that we follow similar to any other affordable housing transaction. Um, there was a comment made about controls around the asset. I think um, it was the mayor who mentioned that with any other housing asset in the city, most of which are privately owned, you know, sort of the exact same situation where, you know, if the city does not directly own an asset or have uh, skin in the game, then you know, that's sort of standard that uh, it's, it's owned and operated in that way. I suppose anybody could come to the city in any situation with any complaint, um, but, uh, you know, that, that hasn't happened at our current assets. Um, I think there were a few more things here. I don't know if there's any other specific issues. Again, I don't have the benefit of seeing the, the sort of two pages um, here. I mean, I think we first met staff uh, over three years ago and have definitely had some conversations um, here and there over the years. Um, in the meantime, I think there's been 30 to 40, you know, 100 plus unit market rate assets that have sold in the city while we continue to have um, this conversation. Um, but, you know, we, we would love to address any other questions that come up and, you know, would be hopeful that we can move forward and, and uh, are actively pursuing things locally that would be actionable transactions in the near future. Thank you. I think the the final one that I'd like you to address is the the issue of potential displacement at years 15 and 30 if the city did not exercise their option. And I don't even know what the what the likelihood of not exercising the option would be, but I what the potential for displacement at those years is um, something that that kind of uh, dinged for me so if right you yeah thank you thank you so for on the on the front end i think we should start there we specifically have a non-displacement clause within the regulatory agreement if you think about inheriting an asset that's 100 percent market rate you're obviously going to deal with a lot of people who are over income from the get-go and not even those people are displaced so we always give the example if someone makes a million dollars a year and really loves living at one of these assets they can stay as long as they like they'll just continue to pay market rent when they move on their own accord, we backfill with tenants who meet the affordability restrictions. So every new lease that is signed from the day that we take over is to a qualifying household. Um, you know, the city, I wanna remind everybody that the city has an option. The city never has an obligation to take title. And so that option kicks in after year 15 and uh, the city can either allow Cal CHA to continue owning and operating the asset, in which case that non-displacement clause is still embedded within the regulatory agreement. Uh, or the city can trigger its option. If the city triggers its option, the city can have whatever policies in place that it likes. And I would assume that a city would similarly have a non-displacement clause. Um, if the city does 
nothing for 30 years, you know, we sometimes use the example that this purchase option is open for 15 years. We never hear from the city. Uh, it opens, it closes. After 30 years, Cal CHA has to have the ability to sell the asset. If, if there's been no interaction with the city, the city's not interested in its option. Um, you know, once again, the option can be assigned. So the city could call, you know, Eden Housing, for example, and say, why don't you take title? You can have it for free. And why don't you restrict it to sub 80% AMI households? The city could also ask Cal CHA to sell the asset, uh, in which case the city could say, we want you to sell this with a perpetual regulatory agreement that restricts it to 60% AMI households. So all of the controls around the long-term affordability um, all are in the city's control. The city would have to um, sort of, you know, be non-responsive for a 30-year period, you know, and or want the affordability to roll off for that to happen. And actually, I just, I just remembered, there was another question about revenues and being sort of uncertain as to what happens with the revenues. There's no uncertainty. I mean, there's bond documents here with a waterfall structure that shows exactly where all the revenues go. And as soon as the, as soon as the bonds have been retired, all of the revenues go to the city, whether the city owns the asset or not. Uh, as you know, upon a sale, all of the net sales proceeds also go to the city. So there's no uncertainty there of any kind. Thank you. Those are all my questions. I guess I, I still have a, I, I understand the workload issue and I just keep coming back to the pension obligation bonds and we're doing all that groundwork um, with, the, with the hopes that we will be ready at an appropriate time. And I, I, I do wanna, I, I think this has been a very healthy discussion and, and having an info, at, at the very least, an info memo with the questions and the answers um, from Catalyst, I think would, would, would help us. I don't see a drawback to having that discussion with the full council, but I'll, I'll Mary, you can weigh in on that. You have a better sense of our horizon report. Thanks, Councilmember. Let's, uh, let's go to Councilmember Camps and we'll come back on that issue. Well, there, there's a few issues here that, 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 that struck me. I mean, I've, I've been in office for eight years and we've been talking about creating more in, low income housing ever since I've been in office. There's never been a time where we didn't have, where we had too many low income housing units and, 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 and the workforce, work, workforce. Uh, we've tried taxing people. We've, we've tried, um, impact fees. We've tried commercial impact linkage fees. We've tried, we've tried um, uh, so many different regulatory ordinances that, that, I mean, it seems that comes up every three months that we have to restrict people or whatever. We've tried to buy hotels and convert them into uh, housing. We have built, we have created tiny homes and all of these things created their own controversy and we're willing to live through it. Uh, in fact, most of these things created a lot more uh, legal liability and staff time and cost the city money. In fact, all of them have created uh, a whole lot of uh, need for staff time um, and legal liability. And we have, we're faced with something here that doesn't put the city on the hook for anything, doesn't require staff to be hired doesn't require any oversight by our um, overseers here. It does not commit us to, to Julia Cooper having any um, worries about the city being on the hook for any money that these, if these bonds can't get paid off, who pays for them? Who, if, these, if, if you can't generate enough income, Jordan, from the, from the if all your units are empty, who's on the hook? Bondholders at all times. It's you know, bondholders. So you're you're literally getting rich people to finance um, poor people or or working class housing. And I really don't see a negative to this. I really don't. Uh, even if even if there's a scandal, God forbid, Jordan is a dishonest guy, uh, and I, and I'm I'm being facetious here, Jordan. Uh, you'll hopefully you'll forgive me. And he runs off with a with a million dollars. It doesn't really say anything about the city because the city didn't, you know, it, 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 we're, we're all, all our focus is on trying to create housing. There are dishonest people in industries and, I've, and I've, we've had problems with, with, with units that have been 
owned by the city. One only needs to go across the street and look at Donner Lofts, a brand new building, and look for low income housing and look at how much problems we've had with that. So I, I don't know about the argument with reputation. We, the reputation of the city, I, I don't know. I don't know that we have a, a reputation of producing low income housing at low cost. Because as I remember, most of our housing costs above $700,000 a unit. And this costs us nothing. I'm gonna repeat this, it costs us nothing. No taxes to go up. Um, no, and, and it doesn't matter what the transaction costs. Whatever, whatever the transaction costs are, if the bond holders are willing to pay for it, the bond holders are willing to pay for it. it doesn't commit us to paying any transactions. Um, as far as it taking a whole lot of staff time, we've included uh, what other cities have done. It's a resolution. That's all that needs to be passed. There's no, uh, what I'd like to see is us discuss it, at least on the November 10th meeting. We're having a meeting, 90% of everything we're going to discuss on November 10th is housing. I'd love to see this included in, in our strategy. Um, this has to be a strategy. If, we, if we're going to call ourselves a I mean, literally the staff used this, Jackie used this. This is an, you know, we want to do everything. Um, it's an all of the above approach is our, the exact words Jackie used in a presentation a couple of uh, weeks ago when we talked about displacement and creating housing. Why isn't this part of the all above approach? This doesn't really require a whole lot of, um, you know, it, for me, um, it's a no brainer. Uh, and as far as the, the units that they're buying, they're buying market rate housing. They're not buying low income housing. We're not taking low income housing off the market and keeping it low income housing. They're taking market rate housing and converting it into low income housing. So th let's just be clear. Uh, sorry, not low income housing, but workforce housing. So let, we're not displacing low income uh, people um, or, or keeping low-income people, they're buying market. Am I wrong? Am I wrong to understand that, Jordan? Are are you going to be displacing uh, low-income folks, or are you going to be buying units that that house um, low-income people? No, I think the important point is we don't displace anyone. Um, you know, turnover rates in in institutionally run multifamily complexes are typically about fifty percent a year, so uh, there's yeah. always a lot of turnover. We force no one out. And you're exactly right. We take market rate housing and we restrict it to, you know, low, median, and moderate income housing. Yeah. So, so uh, to me, the the risk the risk reward level is is extremely low risk and extremely high reward. Uh, we we are not in this space. We we uh, our city is not seriously doing a whole lot to create workforce housing, and rightfully so. We need to concentrate on. Um, and, and I, uh, on the uh, very low income and extremely low income housing. And I've been very proud of the efforts that we've been doing. Um, but yes, this is a new product. Yes, the experience isn't there. And we have tried new things. Take a look at tiny homes. We've had so much resistance and those, so much problems in the past. Um, yes, this is new. We're gonna learn, but do we not do anything? I don't think so. Um, so I would like to make a motion to um, put this forward, at least for discussion. Um, I'd love to see it discussed by the full council. Um, I'm hoping November 10th, but if we have to make it past November 10th, I'd be okay with that too. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councilman Chemist. Uh, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Right. Uh, Lee, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just really quickly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to kind of express if, if the rules committee wanted to move forward with the November 10th date, um, that the analysis would probably be the analysis in our actual early consideration form. Our ability, given where we're at right now to turn something around on the 10th would be very minimal. Um, but do wanna offer up, um, you know, one of the things um, that Office of Economic Development has been working on, and that's where the housing catalyst manager um, is located is a lot of research and, and future research on financing mechanisms for affordable housing as related to the housing crisis action plan. Um, so while this would um, still be a yellow light, one thing that we could do is continued light touch exploration by OED um, with Jordan. And thank you for being with us today, Jordan, um, 
to flush out more of this is what we think it is, this is what we think it isn't. Because having that conversation here, given that you know Jackie and Julia haven't really come to conclusion with a lot of this analysis with Jordan, um, probably isn't easy on Jordan or, or either of them. I do think uh, the timing of that, I would ask for the Rules Committee to be flexible. Um, it would probably be something in the new year, January, um, because even if OED was going to lead some of that work and report back, um, I think from a city manager's office perspective, we'd want finance heavily involved and kind of end of the year close, um, the CRF rebalancing and some of the bond issuance are, are pretty heavy workloads for finance between now and the end of the year. Okay, thank you, Lee. Um, I would just offer, I, I'm guessing in November 10th is gonna be a challenging day anyway for housing uh, staff, given all the housing items that are there. Um, so I'm not sure we're gonna get much more information out of housing on, on the 10th than we have today. That being said, I understand why waiting a long time is not pr preferred either. And, and so I, I appreciate uh, Lee's offer of some middle ground. I can't help but think that um, articulating really clearly what we want, what we demand would be, I, I know that's been articulated in private conversations, but making that public might be helpful and could even be surfaced sooner than that. And I, I just leave that question out there. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, I don't know, Good Council Member Davis, I think she had some additional questions or comments, no? No, I, I just was, um kind of nodding when, when Lee said, you know, November 10th doesn't seem doable. I'm, I'm fine with it coming later, but sooner than, than priority setting, I guess is what I'm getting at. Okay. Especially since it was already in the work plan, it doesn't need to, it doesn't seem to me that it needs to wait for priority setting. That was so, all. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my question actually is to Julia, Jackie and Lee. I, I heard you, all three of you, very loud and very clear. And I was looking at the uh, early consideration document where it's graded a 10, and particularly some of the high complexity areas where more than five staff members required, more three or more departments involved. So um, based on everything I've heard, based on reading the document, it is going to require a lot of extra work and a heavy lift. Uh, even in a scaled down version that uh, it sounds like my colleagues are asking for. So my question to you and this to all three of you is, if we give council direction to pursue this, what are the unintended consequences or intended consequences of, of that decision? Effectively, what, what gets deferred, delayed? You know, what, what's the impact of us moving forward with this? So the person on the housing department staff that was actually taking the lead who uh, has tremendous experience and no doubt understands the structure the best is Kristen Clements who, hand, who oversees our policy P, um, division. And we're in the middle of rehiring the staff because either staff have been promoted underneath her or have moved on to other cities where the workload is not at the same level that they are, it is here in the city of San Jose. And so she's the only one left. So she, her focus right now is on uh, working on the anti-displacement work plan. And um, we have HUD reports that we have to get done uh, before the end of the year. Uh, and she oversees again, all of the policy work that we're doing that we've already committed to. Uh, and she's working on the affordable housing plan for the Deardon redevelopment that we have to get over the goal line. And that has to be done before the end of this year. So if we ask her who's working more than 40 hours a week to take this on, then she's not gonna be able to work on those other issues, which we have prioritized at least until the end of the year have to get done. And I can't speak to Julie on what her team is working on. Yeah, I mean, you know, we just finished two rather large lease revenue financings and now focusing on a very large airport re refinancing that will 
encompass nearly 40% of their outstanding debt, which their outstanding debt totals over a billion dollars. And you all know that the airport revenues are down and anything we can do to restructure the airport debt is a benefit to the city. Um, we also have the referral on the pension obligation bonds. We get wanna do the pre-funding for the retirement contributions in fiscal year 2022. So that takes effort. And then um, it'll be time to do the GO bonds for against the measure T authorization and some other lease revenue transactions. All things that are like really directly core to the city services that we're providing. So we don't want any of those projects to get delayed or um, sidetracked, um, you know, at this particular juncture, especially related to that airport refunding, which we're really trying to get to council and have closed in early April. All right. And Lee, did you uh, want to add? I think, else? no, I think Jackie and Julia covered it. And I would just say that was based off of the, the full blown workload as we analyzed it. Um, but again, you know, when we come back late, um, late December or in the new year um, with possible high level analysis or a document as the mayor suggested with here's our concerns that would need to be addressed before we move forward. That is something that we could explore at a high level. So yeah, if, I mean, uh, we could get that done. The high level, here's our list of concerns. I, I mean, we have that. So yep. that we could have, and again, it's the what level or what extent do you want us to work on resolving these concerns? Are you just comfortable with them? And maybe you are, but you know, certainly on the staff level, we can articulate that because we have that done. Well, it sounds like Lee uh, presented a possible path forward in terms of um, a light version of, of this effort uh, having OED work on it at a high level. Maybe Jackie, you can provide them with the list of requirements that you've already put together and at least have some activity taking place to move this forward. Otherwise, it sounds like what's going to happen is if we even um, vote on and agree to have a res pass a resolution to join uh, this JPA, there's not going to be any resources behind it. So effectively, we would just join and not be able to execute or implement any opportunities until we get the, our workload balance. So I, I again, I really like uh, Lee's proposal as a path forward. Thank you. Um, Julie, can I just ask, is there risk to our credit rating somehow in any of this? Um, probably. Probably not. It's probably more reputational risk than credit rating risk. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of that, both on the housing and finance side, but like, I don't feel like it's my job to protect PIMCO or BlackRock. You know, they're really sophisticated players. They're a lot smarter than I am. They know how to lose money and win, you know, I, I'm just wondering, I, I'm really interested in seeing that list because even more than the concerns, I'd really be interested in knowing what the demands are. Like what are, what are the demands that are important to the city? Because of the concerns are, you know, bondholders may lose money. It doesn't, I don't lose sleep at night over that. They're, they're big boys and girls. And so I, I guess it would just be really helpful to have that articulated in some, some way. And I appreciate what we suggested, you know, it would be nice if, if perhaps you know, we could see something like that in a public way, and, and hopefully there'd be some further discussion um, with either of these two entities about whether there's receptiveness to whatever conditions the city would want to apply. And I know some of those conditions are quite legitimate, obviously, but um, about ensuring, you know, we're protecting residents or, or whatever, but um, I think it would just be helpful for us to surface really what all the concerns are so we know whether this is, um, to, just to know how heavy a lift this really is to get done. I think we can surface those, Mayor, and bring it back along with this memorandum to a, a rules committee after November 10th, once we're through that housing date, if that works for you. Okay. All right, uh, Johnny, I know you, you've got a motion on, um, would you be willing to continue this for several weeks so that we could get a 
a report back to rules? Yeah, well, if Jackie's already got her list, I'd, I'd love to get it, you know, maybe uh, uh, November 11th, because <laughs> that we're, we're meeting on that day. Um, if, if, and quite frankly, I don't see, I, I really, I'm not sure that I see where the whole work is. If we're not taking any risk, if we're not, you know, we're, worst comes worst comes to worst, we get handed a property after 15 or 30 years of free property, free and clear to us. I mean, uh, that doesn't seem to be a problem to me. Uh, that's one property more than we had before. Uh, that's the way I look at things. Um, and I agree with the mayor wholeheartedly. If, if the investors uh, like myself who invest in PIMCO uh, bonds uh, lose money, tough for me, you know? Uh, <laughs> so in any case, uh, I'd like to see it back uh, November 11th, if you can, since Jackie said that the work is fairly done. So what I would propose, because again, it always takes us time to get things back onto the agenda and we have to dust everything off. And I, again, we're gonna have to pull off Kristen to review it, to make sure that it's all accurate, but we could definitely come back sometime in December with here's our complete list of concerns. There's there's no, is there any meetings before then that we can have this? Since you said that you had it done already. In fact, I, I have a small list already from you. Excuse me, this is, from, this is from uh, Julia, actually. This, this is Tony. I just need to remind you that November 11th is a holiday and we don't have a rule meeting. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> When's the next available meeting after that? I mean, we only have one and then we run into Thanksgiving, don't we? Yeah, we have the 20th. Yep. Is the 20th okay? My preference is to come in that whatever that first week in December, because that gives us plenty of time to ensure that the staff person from OED uh, has time to pull together some of the um, other very limited information on the other alternatives as well. Yeah. Okay, and, and would this go to full council or the rules committee? Which I, I offered to come back to the rules committee. That would be, as we're talking now, December 2nd. What is the preference of the, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just, um, I want, I, I, I really want this, this idea to be daylighted. Yeah. Because I think it, it's a great idea and it one that doesn't really involve a whole lot of risk for us. And I, I, I yeah, sorry. I'd support coming back to, on the second, if we could at least just ask staff to have some amount of engagement of that list with um, both of these entities um, so that they could be able to fully digest it and, and, um, and perhaps, you know, we may find that we're further along than we thought. Thank you, Mayor. All right, I, I will accept that um, amendment to my motion. Okay, and Senator Davis is nodding her head. Yes. Okay. All right, so the motion then is to defer this until the 2nd of December uh, with, uh, with some work to be done by staff. Thank you, Jackie and, and Julia for your willingness to, uh, to find some middle ground here. All right, anything further? Okay, let's uh, vote on that motion. Davis? Yes. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for taking the time. All right, well, uh, I think uh, item four has been removed. I think uh, Councilman Jeff has uh, withdrawn that. Is that right? Yes, okay. that's correct. So that brings us to the pawnbroker ordinance. And I know that uh, Councilmember Sparza has been very patient uh, along with Vice Mayor Jones on this item. Uh, would either of you like to weigh in? I will, um, I'll start out because I don't wanna um, follow Councilmember Sparza because she's a lot more eloquent than I am. Uh, so I wanna first of all thank her for uh, asking me to be part of uh, the memo. One of the, um, Interesting things about uh, when a council member, fellow council member brings you in on a particular policy area is it's an opportunity to really get educated on, on that particular area and the impacts that it has on our community. Um, 
before I had that exposure, I didn't have a, a, a realization of the detrimental impact of a high concentration of pawnbrokers on a community or, or a neighborhood. Uh, just like uh, the mayor has pounded in my head over the last five and a half years, the um, impacts of having an over concentration of alcohol, we see similar impacts and effects with other types of businesses. And so, um, again, once I, was, I became educated and saw what the consequences and ramifications of having an over concentration of those types of businesses, it really um, motivated me to one, participate in the memo, as well as try to advocate for us to move this forward to do a uh, review. And I know that for under early uh, consideration, it did get a, a green light. So hopefully we don't have a long conversation about uh, staff's uh, ability to, to move this forward. So uh, on that note, I wanna pass it over to Councilman uh -huh. Barza. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I, um, this proposal before you allows us as a city to update our pawnbroker ordinance to match the existing process and requirements set in the city's off-sale alcohol beverage establishments ordinance. So by mirroring an existing process um, and requirements, it allows staff to easily implement this ordinance, again, matching a process we're already familiar with. And this uh, proposal does not impact existing pawnbrokers or add any additional steps for pawnbrokers to move or apply for a new conditional use permit. And these uh, changes would ensure by mirroring the off-sale alcohol ordinance would ensure that we're not harming nearby community entities or oversaturating underserved communities with pawnbrokers, an industry that is correlated with crime and the oversaturation of entities that are associating uh, with crime can multiple um, existing barriers that communities face and further hinder the city's efforts to uplift communities throughout the city. And so the city already, by recognizing this correlation, the city already has implemented a limit of pawnbrokers. However, we have no regulation as to where they may be located. And um, I did wanna just point out, we understand that not all pawnbrokers contribute to a negative impact on the community or are associated with criminal, criminal activity. Updating this language would require the Planning Commission to consider the impact uh, on the nearby community prior to issuing a conditional use permit. Um, and so we felt that with the understanding that certain businesses can have a negative impact on the community, it's essential for us as a city to proactively address this issue during a time when it can be easily implemented and will not impact a current business. And that way we're not waiting for an injustice to occur in order to implement the solution. And I humbly request that the um, committee add it to a future council agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to members of the public now. Uh, Jeremy Taylor. You guys should move all pawn brokers the same way you did the marijuana dispensaries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, person ending in 5140. Yeah, I agree with the last guy. Move all the massage parlors, pawn shops, pot shops, and, and some more pool halls all in that industrial area. Make like a mini red light district and then start generating some revenue because in the end, that's the only thing that you're going to be able to make money off of because businesses are moving out of here due to all the regulations, everything else. But these kind of businesses never go out of business. Open up some liquor stores, like some discount liquor stores too. You know, what, what the heck? I mean, if, every, if all these things are so bad, like marijuana and liquor, cigarettes, uh, uh, massage parlors, all these places, if they're so bad, they should be illegal, right? Trying to regulate or tax them out of business is, 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 a, is a really weak way to go. Get hardcore, make it illegal, or open up an area for them to do it. You'll, those are the only choices you have. War is going to go underground, and you're going to get nothing 
And then the only thing you're going to get is pictures on Twitter of what Eddie Garcia busting people for marijuana, shake marijuana, and a crappy pistol. That's all you, that's all you guys know how to do. You guys give uh, citations at the park, parking citations, and, and, and you give citations for jaywalking and people carrying shake marijuana and a crappy gun. That's all you guys – you don't do any – you don't enforce laws. All you guys do is try to revenue things. And if you're gonna do it right, do it right, and and have and have inspectors being able to go in and collect the tax revenue. But you're, if it's so bad, make it illegal. Make, do you realize the state of California makes more money off a carton of cigarettes than Philip Morris does? So imagine what you can you can make if you tax everything fairly. People don't go underground to buy their pot or or, or other things. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm uh, just uh, really digging under the surface here, uh, to the uh, surface level here. I don't fully uh, understand. I know we'll understand more uh, in the months ahead when this comes back to us. I'm still trying to understand what's criminogenic about a pawn shop in particular. Obviously, we know that there are different places where folks who are stealing goods can try to fence those goods, but pawnbrokers pawn are pretty well regulated. And so they, my understanding is they tend to go more online these days. Um, I, I looked at the study that was cited, or one of the studies, uh, the one involving robberies in Chicago, and really the focus was on cash-based businesses. So it's bars, fast food restaurants, cash, uh, check cashing centers and pawn shops. Um, and the focus is because it tends to attract people who carry cash who obviously could be distracted or vulnerable to robbery. And I can understand that. But obviously, we know in many of our low-income communities, cash is necessity because people can't get banked and they can't get access to credit. So I, I guess I, I'm still trying to understand better the nexus between pawn shops and what we might think of as a typical criminogenic business. Like, for example, a liquor store, we know there's a connection between booze. We know that gambling, uh, there's clearly a connection between gambling addiction and a lot of social ills. This one is harder for me. And so anyway, I look forward to learning more uh, as we go ahead. Uh, but I just wanted to raise that as a general concern as we move forward. Um, any other comments or questions? Not, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve our memo. I'll second it. Okay. And if I could just ask if staff is looking into this to help us substantiate whether these are truly criminogenic businesses or they're simply, I guess, in the terms of this research that was done in Chicago, uh, crime attractors by virtue of the fact that they're cash businesses, because obviously we have lots of cash businesses and we don't necessarily regulate those in the same way we would a liquor store. So I, I just want to try to understand um, what exactly is criminogenic here. Okay. Uh, on the motion, let's vote. Davis? Aye. Camus? Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did I, did I undo my uh, microphone, uh, Tony? Was I? No, oh, I had you as absent. Is that oh, I apologize. I, I kept clicking and it clicked twice every time I clicked once. I apologize. Is, is that, that a yes? It yeah. was a yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Item six is consideration renaming the public arena facility in honor of Rick Doyle. Um, is customer Pearls with us? I don't believe he is. Okay. Uh, let's go to the public. Mr. Beekman. Hello, thank you. It's been a very interesting uh, rules and open government meeting today. Thank you. Um, uh, and a thank you to the mayor for clarifying his, uh, the ideas of, of what uh, body camera footage issue, how to address the issue. I needed to know that and now I do and uh, thank you. Uh, at the January 22nd uh, rules and open government meeting, uh, Rick Doyle, uh, he, he gave some interesting opinions that uh, I think really noted just uh, my own personal experience in, in being around him and working with him and uh, 
understanding his ideas of, of law. And it was, he offered something very decent and professional and wise, and it was really nice. And it just, I, it just set in motion that I, fe I felt that as a city, we could really work towards the issue of body cameras uh, and how it can be more accessible in the future. And he, he offered the words to do that, and that was the way he worked. And I wish I wish he could do that. I wish we all could do that more often and more proactively. And unfortunately, uh, one's own beauty, you know, it, it doesn't always flourish. It comes in, you know, here and there. And uh, and when he's on, it's it's a it was a really nice thing. And uh, so I thank you for his work. And I, I'm inspired in how to uh, really address the future of the body camera issue and. Um, how it can be a more accessible process to the everyday public. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Back to the committee. Motion to approve. Second. All right, on the motion, let's vote. Davis. Aye. Chemis. Aye. Jones. Aye. Ricardo. Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, uh, staff update on recommendations to establish encampment blight and brush removal agreements. I see Jim is here. Hi, Jim. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the committee. Jim Orpal, Deputy City Manager. I have a short presentation for the committee, Mayor, that I'll give. Uh, this is a report back from a September 2nd meeting of the committee where the committee was considering Councilmember Camus and four other council members' memo on working to establish an interagency agreement with Caltrans to have the city take on the responsibility of cleaning up their properties and to have Caltrans reimburse the city for that. Um, we have initiated a lot of work with Caltrans in the intervening weeks, and I wanna just give you an update on that. I'll go to the next slide, please. So if, if the council or the committee recalls as part of our overall EOC Beautify SJ response branch, our kind of guiding framework within the city for our city properties is serving the right locations with the right service at the right frequency. That's what it's gonna to take to get to clean conditions. We're going through a very kind of thorough systemic approach to that. And we're working with Caltrans to see if they can apply the same type of approach to their properties. So next slide, please. So in September of this year, after this direction came from the committee and the council discussed a number of these items in September, I did send a letter to Tony Tavares, the District 4 Director at Caltrans, uh, really explaining the challenges and the concerns our community was having with Caltrans properties and really um, inviting him into a partnership to work with our city staff in a series of workshops to really understand the scope of the problem, to understand how Caltrans is delivering today, the allocation of their resources, and then what it would take to get clean conditions. And there, they um, warmly accepted that, that uh, partnership, that workshop approach with us. Um, and we're putting that in place now. Uh, we have a series of four workshops that I'll go through in a moment. And our goal would be ultimately to get some type of interagency agreement in the first or second quarter of 2021. Um, not necessarily the city doing the work and getting reimbursed, but we're really gonna explore what is the best possible way to get the job done, clean conditions on Caltrans properties. The next slide um, that I'll go over uh, really lays out that workshop process that we're doing with Caltrans. We had our first one last Friday on October 23rd, where we were scoping uh, the, the size of the problem, the service response, talking about the goals that we're trying to collect and we achieve. Uh, Caltrans had a robust team. Uh, the city really described our process, what we're going through for our over 200 properties. I think they found it very um, uh, educational and very uh, helpful. They're gonna do the same thing for the city uh, the city staff at our next workshop on October 30th, understanding their service model, their investments, their approaches. Um, and then we're probably gonna have some small team uh, work 
on mapping, hotspots, service protocols, et cetera. Uh, coming back later in November um, to really kind of understand in detail how do we best uh, kind of have the right type of customer intake systems, service response systems to get at cleaner conditions. Uh, we will have a city council study session on December 4th. I'll be back here at rules next week requesting that this committee set that study session for the council for December 4th. Uh, and then we'll follow that with uh, a final workshop in this series with Caltrans on December 11th, hopefully framing what's the right type of partnership and service model agreement, whether they do it or we do it uh, and they reimburse us. I, I'm sure part of that will be the gaps that they have. They don't have enough resources to get the job done like we would like it to be done or the community would be done. But I think we're gonna understand much better where their gaps and shortcomings and shortfalls are at and what we think may be the best way to go about it. I think we're gonna be in much better position to understand our city gap as well. And we'll talk about that extensively at the December 4th study session. And then as we get into the new year, we'll be looking to frame and develop a interagency partnership agreement. That's the goal. That's what uh, Tony and I have talked about. I think we're both in agreement that some type of agreement is the way to go. I think he's open to piloting and partnering in unique ways with us, uh, maybe different than he's done with other cities and maybe other districts in Caltrans, because I think he sees a great partner in the city, um, you know, like we were able to do on emergency interim housing and other things. I think the state sees an innovative and willing partner in the city. Uh, and then going on to the next slide and of where we're going in terms of other agencies, it's not just Caltrans properties. We're working on many fronts. We have, a, we have an existing memorandum of agreement with Valley Water, uh, but it's really for a, a pre-COVID environment. In the COVID environment, we're looking at doing a side letter to make that more applicable during the COVID situation uh, with limited abatements occurring. We're finalizing our memorandum of understanding with UP. We have our agreement in the UP for their execution, and then it'll come back to us. I've talked about Caltrans at length here. We wanna start conversations with the County of Santa Clara later in 2020, and then begin conversations with VTA and pg e in 2021. So it's a very broad effort. We recognize to get clean conditions across our city there are many agencies that have properties, so it's a huge undertaking, uh, but we're really marshalling as much focus and resources as we can on the issue. And I think I have one more slide and I'll be done. Yeah, it's just, you know, how we're really kind of logically and systemically working through these issues with Caltrans on our properties and then kind of using that model, hopefully in working with the other agencies as well. Obviously it's a huge task in front of us a uh, you know, major effort to get our city to the cleanliness level that we all want it to be, but we're, we're absolutely working down that path um, and there'll be much more to report in December back to the full council. And with that, I'll turn it back to the committee for questions or further comments or direction. Thanks, Jim, appreciate that update. Uh, There's obviously more work underway than I was even aware of, um, so thank you. Um, a lot of agencies. Uh, other comments? Okay, let's go to the public and we'll come right back. Uh, Jeremy Taylor. Hey Jim, I would just like to know where have you been? Why is this a new plan? Why have you not been doing this? In my backyard, I have city of San Jose property with a train track 100 feet away to clarify the only time a fence came up on the train track near my house was when a 16 year old kid got hit by a train and um yeah something that i saw i had to deal with and this is a constant issue over here where i live i've been screaming for a long time because of the hot spot where people go over and under the fence and i've sent those videos we, my neighbors last month had somebody hop over the fence on um, the same side of the street. We have somebody sleeping. I've, I've one of my neighbors literally wrote in spray paint, no, no vagrancy here. 
So where have you guys been? This is this should not be new. This should be ongoing. So Mr. Orball, I implore you to maintain this same energy level as you go forward. And I guess we can look past that you haven't been doing it, but you've got to do better. Because of their blight in my back after my backyard in the city of San Jose lot, people hide there. So let me give you a few examples of what I've dealt with over the years. One time I broke up a rape. One time I broke up a prostitution ring. One time I put out a fire. Four weeks ago, I had somebody shooting heroin on my back fence. So please, you guys don't understand what the what you offer cover and concealment to these people. And when you offer cover and concealment, bad things happen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speakman? Hi, thank you. Um, that was a lot, you know, from the last person. And I don't have the depth uh, of experience in, in, in what happens with, with the homeless issues in San Jose. But I do know that homelessness, you know, in San Jose, it has a rhythm and it has its ups and downs. And as a city government, you go through different patterns and periods of how to how you work with it. And sometimes you're up with it and working with it well, and sometimes not so good. I think you may possibly be in a good upswing in how to be working with it at this time, I'm guessing. And that means that uh, you know, you're having good communication with the homeless and that you know, the, the, the trash bags that are sitting out there in the trash, you know, it's not just, it's more than just accumulating. I, I think there is a certain, you know, there's a sense in each homeless community with the trash, you know, they can be prepared for the trash pickup process. And, you know, to make, you know, those connections uh, relevant and, and open, uh, hopefully that can be something to work on. And, you know, it's, it, those connections are happening, I think, between city and, and the homeless. Uh, with trash issues. And so, so there's hopefully something interesting that's happening in how to work at this time. And so with all the, uh, the ideas mentioned today, uh, I hope you keep that in mind. And, uh, and how we deal with, with our homeless is issues. It's, it is a matter of communication. And yeah, uh, good luck in how we do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, returning to council. Uh, Council Member uh, Davis, forgive me, I'm going to have to leave the meeting. I have a meeting right now with Dave Sykes, but uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, for taking over. Okay, Council Member Davis. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I want to thank you for, for this update and, and frankly, the, um, the progress that's been made so far, setting up the four workshop dates with Caltrans. I think this is the most amenable that they have been in the time that I've been in office to to kind of comprehensively address this issue with us. So I'm I'm glad it seems like it's the the right time for this, which I'm very grateful for. I did want to ask uh, if your if your uh, thought about the study session. I know we're going to talk about kind of what it's going to take moving forward and seeing all of the agencies that you it looks like you've reached out to about half of them of course we have to you know stagger the work we can't do it all at once um i'm thinking that a, a regular report to a committee might be helpful to maintain the focus and the the ability of council to be informed about this is your thought that you would um will you be able to come back to us with this at the study session with a recommendation on whether it should be t and &E or neighborhood services or have you I, I I know you and I know you've already probably put some thought into this so I, I was just thinking one or the other would be um, both both could be appropriate there yeah that's a great question councilman Davis um, I, I think yeah one or the other or both could be appropriate probably to this point in time we've been working with the council as a whole and the rules committee because it really is touching every part of our city. Right. We've kind of seen that. And I think I think we've seen interest across the entire council. But hopefully in 2021, we're getting more into an implementation, uh, a refinement, continued progress type of situation. And a committee referral could be the, the right way to go. It, 
um, you know, it, and either one of those committees could be the, the right place. Yes, we'll, we'll raise that uh, in the study session and see if, if the whole council's ready to have it go to a committee or whether the council still wants to kind of endure the, the challenge of kind of working through the whole thing. I, I think we're open. It probably would be good to get into a committee. Yeah. Um, so good points. I was just thinking about, you know, work plans coming up for the, for 2021. I know we kind of do them on a six month basis. So um, something to, something to think about. I'm going to, of course, put a plug in for t &E because I think, especially working with Caltrans and um, Valley Water, that fits into that. But I also know that Parks has been taking a, a big chunk of that work. So that's why I, those were kind of the two I was thinking of. Yeah. And, and if we want to cross-reference them, I, you know, there probably aren't too many people who are on both committees. So you end up catching most of the <laughs> most of the council in those two committees without it taking up too much time of, of you know, too much other staff time at a, at a full council meeting. Yeah, and, and so we're, we're getting ready to start the work planning process for the spring, like you said. I'll talk it over with Angel and, and Lee and the city manager, and we'll figure out whether we want to put it on both, do the same type of, you know, we'll look who the different council members are in each one of them, and right. we'll come up with the right way to keep, keep the, uh, the council and the committees informed in 2021. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Camus. Yeah, well, I think um, Councilmember Davis kind of took my thought pattern. And, <laughs> uh, I was exactly <laughs> thinking that, that we, sh we should be getting updates on this on a regular <laughs> basis and really appreciate your, your work on this and um, your leadership. I, I've, um, I've had good, I, I can't say that I've had all bad things happen with Caltrans and, and, and I've, I've had some good success three or four years ago, but um, the relationship has gotten strained ever for, for a long time. And I appreciate your work on this, Jim. And uh, uh, that's all. It, and do we need a motion uh, to uh, to accept this report or is, uh, is it? Let, let, let me make one quick comment. Uh, Caltrans is being, I think, very cooperative. I really like their engagement at our first workshop last week. We did a number of prep sessions to get it lined up. I do think resources is gonna be their challenge and we're gonna to have to try and find a way to, to see if they can see the partnership opportunity and flex towards us and try and see if we can get some new things working, some innovative things working, some more consistent and systemic things working. Um, get our community understanding, you know, it's their property and how we can open up and get better communication response from them. So. There's a lot of work to be done. I, I'm not, I don't want to under, underestimate what we have in front of us here. I like their spirit. Um, and it's still going to be a whole lot of work to get to where we want to get to. But we, we absolutely want to do that with them and get there. So we, we appreciate this committee's attention on the issue. And I, and I appreciate that, um, that, that we're, you're moving forward on this. One thing that I've always said is an ounce of prevention or, you know, I've always used that phrase, an ounce of prevention is, is better than a pound of cure. And I've brought this up in the past. And have you talked to, in, in your talks with Caltrans, they have access to the CHP. Now, um, a lot of the, the, the garbage that's being dumped on our highways and, and are people who don't cover their trucks or are, are, are truly just illegal dumping. Um, how are they looking at enforcement as a potential tool? Well, they, they've used enforcement in the past with the CHP. I, I don't know their current level of enforcement prioritization. Um, it's certainly something we'll talk to them about. And it's something that we're going to, I, I have a meeting coming up in the next couple of weeks about city enforcement and the various aspects. It, it does... It does remind me a little bit of the fireworks enforcement conversation the council had yesterday. Um, you know, and I know the council was really pressing the issue with staff and, um, you know, there's a resource aspect to this and, and there is a, 
kind of an efficacy aspect of this too. And um, maybe we can learn something from the fireworks aspect to figure out how can we be more effective in the illegal dumping and trash area. So, you know, I'll monitor that and, and we'll see what's possible. I suspect when we come back in this, in the, uh, we can talk about this more next week, but in terms of what we'll be able to cover in the study session, you're going to see some things that are very well developed and fairly far along. And you're going to see some other things that are in the earlier stages of, of idea formation and, uh, you know, concepts. Um, and that enforcement area, it's going to take some work to have a, an effective, robust enforcement program. But I agree, ultimately, we have to have that. Um, and that's part of any model response program. That yeah, is well, absolutely part of it. Well, uh, unlike fireworks, some of these people have the, uh, a, a risk, a big risk of losing their truck <laughs> if, they, if they get caught illegally dumping or if they get fined for not covering their load. I mean, th these are fines. And so mm -hmm. it is, uh, a, a, if you're running a company, you don't want to get too many of these fines. So I, I, I would just uh, and, and, uh, encourage you to broach that sub subject with them at your next meeting. And I thank you do. again for your efforts. We will do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Council member, this is Lee. I, I uh, want to check in with Nora. I don't believe we need a motion. The, the recommendation is receive, a, receive information, so you're not accepting a report or anything. So I don't believe you need an, uh, a motion. Correct. Okay, well, um, we won't uh, ask for, I won't ask for a motion, but I do want to say, Jim, uh, tremendous job. I remember when we first broached this to you and I remember you were very professional but I remember also remember the look on your face like wow how am I gonna tackle this so we, we've come a long way and I'm I'm looking forward to um, when your vision that you're creating you know comes to fruition and I just want to give you a compliment on the tremendous job and to encourage you to actually stick around the city until <laughs> your vision comes to life so I'm just putting a plug in there. I don't know how convincing I am, but I just want to throw that out there. Anyway, great job. We really appreciate it. It might take me another 30 years, Vice Mayor. <laughs> just kidding. No. I'm on, I'm on a much faster track than that. I'm just kidding. You know, that, thank that, you for that. I appreciate it very much and, and look forward to, uh, to, to bringing uh, our progress back to the council and the committee. Thank you. I hope you're more persuasive than I am, Vice Mayor, because I already had this pr conversation in private with Jim trying to get him to stay. He wasn't having it. Yeah, I've gone private, public. I might have to get one of those uh, airplanes with the banners on the back. <laughs> anyway, moving on before, before Jim starts blushing. Uh, <laughs> next is um, item eight. City Attorney Appointment Compensation and Compensation Package. And we don't have any public speakers. So bringing it back over to my colleagues. Motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, can we get a roll call, please? Davis? Aye. Kimmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Licardo absent. Okay, Nora, congratulations. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Next is open forum. And we have first speaker, Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, thanks for the meeting today. It was really good. Um, you know, being at the meeting today, it just made me realize um, I, I, I really lack knowledge in, in, in how to talk about the depth of the issues that you work on. Yet I'm trying to learn how to speak the language and how to be a part of the community and a part of the community effort. And it takes time and work and I'm just thin and sallow and and behind and you know it's uh, it's sad but but I try and um, you know I'm trying to be humble to it 
the experience of, of this process. And uh, I thank you for your patience, and I hope you can continue to have patience as I learn to try to speak my mind and what is what can be good practices and good ideas. And and I think, you know, in being so far behind, I hope you can have patience just in my role of just, I have to learn just to be able just to present good ideas and just be able to let it sit at that. And just to hear a good idea in this public comment time uh, can be hopeful and helpful, I think. So uh, I hope you can have patience as we continue this process into the uh, fall and next year and through the election time. And good luck to everyone in the election time. I worked really hard uh, this this October to try to like work toward a community effort. We're all going to be happy to be doing that in the next few months. And uh, I hope we take care of each other and respect each other. It may be just some difficult moments, and uh, we'll get through it. You have a good council agenda for November to uh, that to remedy that. I think so. Thank you for your housing ideas and. Uh, I guess that's about all. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Uh, phone number 5140. Yeah, it's been weird. You guys are skipping over me today. I'm going to have to start calling with other numbers so you guys can't block me. But that's okay. Uh, this city needs to get back to the basics, you know, clear the waterways. Do something with the homeless. Make sure 911 works properly, that you actually don't get put on hold. Uh, take care of derelict buildings in my neighborhood that have, that were uh, houses that have burned down, and they're just sitting there derelict, derelict strip malls that are burned out. This is all in Pam Foley's district, by the way. Pam, if you're listening, you might want to do something about it. Uh, there's uh, been blight, people dumping stuff in the neighborhood. District 9 needs a redo, and a lot of roads are really bad that need to be repaved. Potholes need to be fixed, which they usually are fixed quickly, but the roads that need to be repaved are terrible. You guys just have to get down to good old-fashioned politics and, and procedures and getting things done versus all these, you know, just paying money for backpacks for kids and raising flags and having these parades. And you guys go on and on and on about uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. I mean, actually do some real work. All of you people who are left there on the city council today, get off of your duffs and actually do some real work. Fix this city. But all I hear is talk from you people. That's all you ever do is talk. And, and you know, once again, I, I, I've been really surprised. They ha there hasn't been baby wipes brought up yet today. The stupidest thing in the world, we're going to buy baby wipes for people. It's unbelievable. Uh, but, yeah, why don't you guys fix what you have? You want to build more? You're crazy. You can't handle what you have right now. You can't even handle the pig population. It's really easy. You get dogs, and you get a gun, and you shoot them. It's just that. Wow. Okay. Um, meeting is adjourned.